The transversus abdominis plane block is a useful technique to provide analgesia for procedures on the lower abdomen. In this video, we'll describe the anatomy, sonoanatomy, and some tips and tricks to ensure your patients get the most out of your tap blocks. The abdominal wall is made up of several muscles. Posteriorly, we have the psoas major, the erector spinae group, the quadratus lumborum, and latissimus dorsi. Running down the anterior midline is the rectus abdominis muscle. The lateral wall of the abdomen consists of three stacked muscles and fascia layers. The innermost is the transversus abdominis, the middle and the thickest layer is the internal oblique, and the outermost is the external oblique muscle. The spinal intercostal nerves exit the vertebral foramina and wind their way around the trunk between the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique. They penetrate the rectus sheath before emerging anteriorly to innervate the anterior midline. At the mid-axillary line, they also give off a lateral cutaneous branch, which divides to innervate the anterior lateral and posterior lateral aspects of the trunk. Together, the anterior cutaneous and lateral cutaneous branches innervate the majority of the truncal surface, minus the area at the posterior midline. The intermuscular fascial plane the nerves travel in within the abdomen is called the transversus abdominis plane. We're going to block the nerves here, upstream of the lateral branch takeoff, so we get the maximum effect. Here we see the superficial muscles of the abdomen. On the left, the external oblique and its aponeurosis cover the entire lateral abdominal wall. On the right, we've peeled away the external and internal obliques and we can see the transversus abdominis and rectus abdominis muscles. We've done this with a purpose so we can see both the lateral and anterior cutaneous branches of the relevant nerves and where they travel. First, we have the lateral and anterior cutaneous branches of T10. You can see that the lateral branch divides and sends a twig posteriorly while the anterior branch, two layers deeper, keeps on trucking until it pops out through the rectus. T11 is very much the same story. The T12 or subcostal nerve sends a lateral cutaneous branch down over the iliac crest and innervates the skin over the gluteus medius. The anterior branch also ends up terminating superficial to rectus. The iliohypogastric nerve has a twig to the gluteal region before continuing on towards the suprapubic area. And finally, the ilioinguinal nerve runs alongside the inguinal ligament. These last two nerves are primarily derived from L1. Of course, there are other nerves in the upper abdomen, but these aren't relevant to our tap block discussion, and they'll be covered in a different video. The aim of the block is to deposit local anesthetic here in the transversus abdominis plane. If we stay at or posterior to the midaxillary line, we'll be sure to catch the takeoff of those lateral cutaneous branches and ensure we'll cover both the midline and the lateral aspects of the lower abdomen. With the patient's supine, the probe is applied to the mid-axillary line between the iliac crest and the costal margin. A block needle is inserted in plane from the anterior aspect and advanced to the target fascial plane. Here's a typical sonogram for the tap block. Note the three layers of muscle, with subcutaneous fat above and the abdominal cavity below. The tap plane is the bright fascial line between the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscle. This is where the nerves travel. A needle will be seen entering the screen from the anterior aspect. A good way to make sure you're looking at the correct muscles is to start scanning near the abdominal midline. Here we see the thick internal oblique inserting into the linea semilunaris. As we travel more laterally, the external oblique and transversus abdominis muscle appear, superficially and deep respectively. We continue to follow these three muscles around to the mid-axillary line, where the transversus comes to an end. This is an important landmark for the tap lock. You want to ensure that your local anesthetic reaches this point to provide the best possible spread and therefore sensory block to the nerves. Here we see the needle approaching from the anterior aspect located within the internal oblique muscle. The needle tip enters the tap plane and a small test injection of saline confirms we're in the right location. We then switch to the local anesthetic and continue to inject. The needle is continually advanced within the dissected plane in order to leverage hydraulic force to unzipper the two muscles. As a needle is advanced, we move the probe in the same posterior direction to keep the tip on the screen. And here we see that we've reached the end of the transversus abdominis, which is our goal for injection. Once the injection is finished, the needle is removed and the block is repeated on the contralateral side. This is a volume block, and we seem to get our best results when we use 25 to 30 mils on each side. Make sure you're careful with your concentrations when using large volumes of local anesthetic. These are small nerves, and dilute solutions work well to get a good effect. 
We can expect to get the lower part of the abdomen from about the umbilicus to the pubis and including the skin on the lateral aspect of the pelvis and hip joint. We use a tap block for cesarean delivery, lower abdominal pelvic incision such as for hysterectomy, bladder surgery, and some oncologic procedures. We also use it for anterior approaches to lumbar spine surgery. What tap is less ideal for is anything above the umbilicus. It really isn't designed for that. And we have other blocks such as the subcostal tap, the QL, and the ESP block. And here are some tap tips. Number one, use the tectonic sign to define the layers. In a slim patient, it's often not hard to identify the three muscle layers on the screen. In many patients, however, instead of three layers, the screen looks like a seven layer bean dip. Now, remember that the internal and external oblique muscles are oriented at 90 degrees to each other. And because of that, if you fan your probe in a cephalocaudid fashion, the muscle layers will appear to run back and forth with respect to each other, like tectonic plates sliding during an earthquake. The transversus muscle and the fat don't tend to give the illusion of motion, and so you can quickly identify the obliques and work from there. Number two, you want to hit the tap plane at a very shallow angle because you need to move that needle along. If you have to turn a 60 degree corner after hitting the plane, it's not going to be a satisfying block. Calculate your depth to the tap plane on the screen and then insert your needle that far out from your probe surface. To hedge for safety, you can always start by aiming laterally at your probe surface and once you see your needle on the screen, walk it down sequentially until you're in the correct plane. And lastly, I'll say it again, you need to stick and move, stick and move. In the early days of tap, we got a lot of results like this Danish volunteer study. And it was because we were landing the needle in one spot, injecting, and then high-fiving each other and walking away. And because all the local stayed in one location, we got less than ideal results. The tap plane often doesn't peel apart like a buttery rectus sheath block. You need to use the hydraulic pressure head of your solution to unzipper that plane and ensure that you have the greatest degree of spread possible. When we pay attention to this technical aspect of the block, our results are consistent and reliable.